In 1987, Street Fighter 1 released in Japan, to a resounding... ew. You walked all weird, every attack's either instantaneous or requires a Mayan calendar to predict when it will come out. You can't even jump correctly. It was a game that you could describe as fun, so long as it was spelt without the N. And with a couple extra consonants. Among the trash fire was a quirky little mechanic, where you'd perform special moves by swiveling the movement stick in the right motion alongside a corresponding input. A motion input, if you will. But it wasn't just the motion, it also required strict timing, and when placed alongside the control problems of literally every other mechanic was intensely frustrating in a game already full of frustration. The attacks might have been putting your opponent's life bar through the floor and their face through the cabinet, but the reward that you got from the move only cushioned the blow of how aggravating it felt to get there. Fireballs also tank the frame rate, but I think that's the least of our problems. We should probably get rid of the whole punching nipples gimmick to determine attack strength. While we're at it, how about we add a couple different playable characters and revamp all the movement, develop an incredible soundtrack, and oh, accidentally made the basis for an entirely new genre. For the near infinite list of changes made to create debatably the most important game of all time, a lot of them were merely refinements. You don't have to commit to walking, attack timers are far more understandable, you can actually jump instead of whatever the fuck this was. Street Fighter was now infinitely more accessible and intuitive in every aspect, even in those motion inputs which stayed over. Hadouken still hurt the CPU as much as the opponent, but getting an attack to come out now doesn't require you to align your chakras and pull a McTwist to whiff DP. You still had to pull off the motion, but you no longer had to do it with such restrictive timing. So long as your stick went this way, and it was followed fairly quickly by the right button, you're all good. In Street Fighter 1, you only had three motions to go along with your three special moves, shared between Ryu 1 and 2, but the sequel introduced new characters, with new moves, and with it came their own unique motions. You've still got quarter circles and Zs, but now you've also got half circles, full circles, holding down one direction for a while, and flicking the opposite way after a predetermined amount of time. Not every input ended up being shared between the characters, and as a result, you not only had a cast that were functionally diverse, but also felt distinct in their control. As a result, you're likely to develop an attachment to the characters that control the way that you like, and dislike those who go by inputs that you're not aligned with, even if all of it was easier than the mess that came prior. Since the motions got easier, the moves that came out of them also stopped being win buttons with extra steps. Instead, being able to perform a motion input granted you access to moves with unique properties, though they weren't exactly going crazy with it. That was, until other developers started chiming in and doing their own thing. What those developers did wasn't necessarily interesting they iterated on a concept. Mortal Kombat experimented with double tap inputs, like placing more emphasis on directions of inputs rather than the motion of them, and SNK wanted to put the next generation of players through control scheme hell. The thing is, these games were cashing in on the overflowing success of Street Fighter 2. Realistically, their games copying the homework from Capcom's brainchild, which in reality just worked on the work of its older brother, and then the games that followed that copied them. Systems were taken, but were only changed in minor ways to be comfortable to the existing audience that they were trying to steal from. Soon motion inputs became a standardization within the genre thanks to audience expectations, a standard that hasn't shifted up until today. Problem is that for all the slight changes to input management that might have made motion inputs more comfortable for the people that could already do them, they never changed to shift with the expectations of a wider gaming audience. But the games that they're inside of have changed a lot not to mention the type of environment that we're playing them in. We aren't playing in arcades anymore for a pound to play for two minutes. We're in our rooms, taking 50 pound and choosing between King of Fighters and Elden Ring, and expecting to be able to sit down and enjoy ourselves for at least an hour. Then we play League of Legends anyway. Harder input for higher reward was very direct in Street Fighter 1, but even as soon as Street Fighter 2 rarely was that the case, and in the modern era, that line is as stringent as it's ever been. Motion inputs now aren't really connected to any preconception of reward. Sometimes they're not even connected to an attack, or are tied to moves that require a lot more understanding to use effectively. But the barrier that they impose is still in place, so what value do they bring to fighting games as a system? And what drawbacks do they supply? Let's start off real obvious. Shoryukens, or the universal idea of a DP, is very common within fighting games. It's a move that normally goes up, normally is invincible on startup, but not always, and often functions as the most secure anti-air in a player's arsenal. Generally speaking, they have a motion that goes like this, and is often the clearest example of why motion inputs do have value, because of how the motion for the move stops the player from performing certain actions, but only based on their ability. Now let's make this very clear right now, the input won't stop me from doing this. But if you're getting hit by this, that's on you. <laughs> 
The motion doesn't impact spam or repetition, regardless of input complexity, instead its real value comes from how it affects smaller situations. For example, let's say I'm fighting Dudders and he jumps over an attack, not so early that I don't have time to respond, but not late enough to prepare a response. Let's also, for the sake of argument, not factor in universal parries, which are exclusive to Third Strike. I've got the low risk option of blocking and the medium risk option of crouching heavy, which are both tied to simple inputs. The simplest option gives me no reward, and in reality can fuck me over later, while the other rewards me slightly but flips the opponent out. Which in reality can be a good or a bad thing, depending on the Dudley's tendencies, but for the sake of the argument, let's just say that's something we don't want. Then lastly we have our motiony friend, which is the fastest move and gives us the most reward not only in damage but also in frame advantage that comes with the knockdown. However, despite technically being the second fastest option, its risk will sit somewhere between about the same as crouching heavy to Leon stop going for it, you literally never hit those! And that's because the player has nearly all of the control in how quickly this move comes out. If you're in your 20s and you've been playing fighting games for like 3 or more years, the motion's gonna have become incredibly quick and consistent, making jumping in on you a terrifying experience, even if I have advantage. If you're on month one of fighting games, unfamiliar with this situation and not as confident in the motion, you aren't just going to be slower at doing the shoryuken, you're also going to be more prone to error. I remember it took me years to not accidentally flop a hadouken out of my hands, and even now sometimes it happens. This makes the jump in scenario one with a lot of room for skill display, where you aren't just given right and wrong choices, but bad to excellent ones that fluctuate based based on how well the player can access their tools. If a player is really good at motion inputs and they choose to block an attack that they could have potentially sure you through, it might have been a choice that was right, but still a choice that was bad. The risk for that player was very low, and they've thrown away advantage that basically up-forwarded into their hands. If a player is really bad at motion inputs and they choose to block an attack that they could have potentially sure you through, it was a choice that was not only right, but good for that player. They've decided against putting themselves at risk by understanding their own limitations, and not greeting in a position that they're not likely to be able to capitalize on. If you remove the motion input and assign Shoryu to a single button, you'd not only need to change the startup on Shoryu to not invalidate Crouching Heavy Punch, but you'd also severely reduce the complexity of the situation. Not so much that you'd eliminate it entirely, but enough to frustrate the people that are looking for more. This is the part where I look at motion inputs and go, these are fucking rad! The moves are the same between every player on paper, but their own ability provides different moves with their own benefits and drawbacks unique to the individual's perspectives. The intention of motion inputs in the modern space is not necessarily to be a system that has harder input for higher reward. Instead, it's supposed to occupy the same space as something like your ability to aim well in a precision shooter, a basic function that the player has control of at all times, but their ability to control it changes how it can be applied. Oh, oh, my God. God. The only difference being that here the barrier is at the point where you access the move, not exclusively how it's controlled. Okay, maybe it's not the only, the key difference. When you take into account how emotion might interact with movement and blocking, it all works towards a goal of making the player unique in their ability to control their character, which is good. But it's not without its issues. Now don't get me wrong, I think that motion inputs can be fun, and not even exclusively in relation to fighting games. The fact that Skate, a game that has motion inputs at its functional core, is so fun is a testament to the fact that unconventional input systems can be engaging. But while I think it's fun for everyone here in an environment where there's no stakes and you decide the pace of everything yourself, I think it poses some issues in the way that we interact with fighting games. Mostly at the entry level, though not exclusively. For example, and I promise this is going somewhere, the hellhole that is League of Legends. If I don't like the key to access alt, I can change that. The input to access the tool is kept very simple, because the game wants as a lower barrier between you and using the tool in your path towards victory. And that goes for every tool, in almost every game. Input in most major multiplayer titles is extremely modular, because the controller is intended to be the vessel that the player uses to interact with the game to the point where the controller dissolves away. It's why you can change things like camera sensitivity and set analog thresholds. Games might be made with a specific controller in mind, but the controller is not designed to be a part of the game. Most of the time, single mechanics are separated across the input device, so while mechanics might interrupt or interact with other mechanics in the game, on the controller they're disconnected. You can use as much input as you like to call for as many actions as you like, and the game only cuts off actions at the mechanical level. Generally speaking, this creates a fluid control scheme, although not always fluid mechanics. 
Fighting games, on the other hand, are partially modular. You can change the buttons that correspond to what attack type and even assign the directional axis to different sections of an input device, but it's impossible to remove the actions from the axis and how they're accessed inside of it. The controller, to a large extent, is designed into the game. At its worst, this leaves people with certain types of impaired motor function to be severely limited in how much of the title they can experience. At its best, this means that character choice is not just a question of mechanical function and control, but also a question of physical control. I look at most big body grapplers with quite a lot of interest. They're normally very hard read centric and are normally more visually grotesque than many others in the cast, which is a quality I fucking adore. But I don't play them. Why? because 360 motions, more specifically, attacks that have up inputs inside feel wildly uncomfortable to me. For me, this is a lockout of playing a character type that I would like to play, but it's not a problem with 360 motions. Each player will find their own unique quirks of what they do and don't like about the controls and the motions they're specifically averse to, and as such, characters that might functionally appeal may not physically appeal. I played Bedman for the first year of playing Guilty Gear properly because the motions were simple, and the characters that I wanted to play were characters that I couldn't use the motions for. If players could at least rebind attacks to different motions, you'd eliminate some of this disconnect between the ideas that they want to play with and the controls preventing them from getting there. But since moves are also balanced by how it interacts with the controller, it's also unlikely that you'll ever be provided with that freedom. That begs the question, how does emotion provide balance? If we go back to the previous example, Shoryuken, isolated from its input, invalidates Crouching Heavy Punch. It's faster, safer, with more guaranteed reward, but the motion provides it with some risk. Since the axis that controls emotion input also controls blocking, in this scenario, holding back is the only way you can block. Crouching Heavy Punch requires an input that cannot double up as defense, but is a very fast input. Shoryuken, on the other hand, requires you to pass through three different inputs that do not permit you to defend, before you can even have the move come out to potentially trade. If we were to assume that I represent the average seasoned player, I can do this motion in 10 frames on left and 8 frames on right. This means that while Shoryu might technically be active on frame 2, the startup for the move is 2 frames, plus however quickly I can input the motion, extending the amount of time that I cannot defend myself. This is why when Shoryu like moves aren't on this motion and are given inputs that are either quicker or more defensive, their properties often account for it. For every attack that has direct attack properties, the motion is considered in how it impacts the fight. The way that most fighting games are built from a balanced perspective and what makes individual moves so interesting is the exact same thing that stops them from being more flexible from the perspective of control, since giving the player the ability to shift the input around gives them the a chance to make inputs easier or quicker than intended. For little Leon learning fighting games, this left me exclaiming, WHY DOES THIS GAME CONTROL LIKE SHIT?! I didn't grow up with fighting game culture, so I wasn't exactly prepared for this control scheme. CS does not ask me to rush B and then play my ocarina to pull out my fucking smoke. So when Hadoukens did, it felt pretty arbitrarily complicated. Now, it's not because moves use motions to balance moves, but without having already achieved the skill to see from that perspective, the controls come across as dysfunctional. What made that so obtuse wasn't just the motion inputs alone, but more the fact that the stick is getting incredibly overworked. It controls all of your movement and blocking and motion inputs, meaning you're using one input to call for three different actions, sometimes all at the same time. Oh, and also your character is controlled relative to the other character and all the characters have different controls. And it was at this point where I traded in Street Fighter 4 and continued to play League of Legends for another three years. Since there's so much packed into one axis, it's not only hard to use motion inputs effectively, but it's also extremely difficult to balance the other two actions in between fucking up your super. This leads to many, many, many moments where new players' expectations on what they're inputting and what actually comes out do not align. This tangling of systems on one input device isn't without purpose. Knowing how and when to switch between all the different actions is a part of what creates a traditional fighting game's unique character control. 
control and contributes heavily to skill gaps. My offensive control could be good, but if I haven't put the time into practicing swapping to defense quickly, I'm gonna get my ass beat. And I do! I stopped playing fighters for a month and suddenly I can't block! But unlike other games that have this kind of physical skill display, all of these actions being on one input makes your character control unique in how well you can overcome the limitations the systems impose. So when new players aren't used to overcoming that hurdle, or the hurdles start to physically change with each character, of course it's frustrating. Motion inputs aren't necessarily to blame here, but they contribute heavily to the challenges that the game puts in front of the player. Not by asking them to put different gameplay elements together to find solutions to problems, but by asking them to work through restrictions to get to the ideas that they've already conceptualized. And then restrictions really can be interesting, and I'm not just saying that because I like traditional fighting games. Like how charge motions that require you to be holding down or back for a certain amount of time ask you to plan ahead and force you to hold ground, but if you're really tricky with it, you can start charging inside of fixed movements like jumps or advancing attacks, and once you've got charge, if you want to do any other action that requires another point on the axis, you have to throw away that charge. If you know the opponent is a charge character, you can then start to plan smaller scenarios around breaking their charge. It's really cool. Also, uh, holy fuck, like side tangent inside of side tangent. This fucking Venom combo is so fucked. The charge motion's down, but the move that comes directly beforehand is a forward. So you have to slam the stick back just to get time for the charge so that the ground bounce combos with the ball. I don't really have any analysis. This is fucking sick. This shit right here, or this, wouldn't be nearly as satisfying if it wasn't a motion. I will die on this hill. But I also can't expect everyone else to. Here's a novel bombshell for you. Making video games is surprisingly very hard. Not only in the process of making a good game, but also satisfying the audience who's spending their money on it. A part of that is thanks to the reality that what turns on one player turns off another. Properties create preferences, and at the end of the day, motion inputs are a property, not a fundamental element of gameplay that this video might imply that it is, or a dated barrier that no longer serves a purpose that this video might also imply it is. It is a gameplay spice, and like all spices, it's down to your own perception whether or not you like what it brings to the dish. The objective effects of motion inputs is that it makes the moves that they're attached to more complex to access. That is it small and unassuming, but much like a good marinade, it's how it clings to the rest of the dish that matters. And I'm gonna stop using this analogy now. Character control is harder, not because motion inputs alone are difficult, but because of the balancing act of the systems that it's interconnected with. Learning new characters isn't as straightforward, because motions as a system never gained universalization, since most motions are used to give characters further identity. Motions in many games aren't removable, because moves are balanced in the knowledge of how they're accessed via its motion. Ultimately, it's up to you to decide whether or not that's a good or a bad thing, but if you'd let me do an Anthony Fantano for a moment, I'd like to try in with my two cents into your potential opinion. I liked him, but as someone who's interested in fighting games is falling rapidly, I'd be lying if I said that they weren't a contributor as to why it's falling. Having to learn a whole new set of controls with each new character is an active detriment to my ability to give a shit. It keeps me locked into playing a small set of characters, since I don't want to throw away the basic input that I'm used to just to learn a new character. At that point, I would just play a different game. Motion inputs aren't alone in causing this problem, but it is a contributor, and when I, as an experienced player, am getting sick of the first challenge being accessing parts of my toolkit, I can't imagine it's a challenge people want to overcome when they haven't got the knowledge of the more interesting challenges that lie ahead. At the same time, when I'm playing a character I'm familiar with, I forget that it exists in the first place. All of the interesting elements about how it extends risk isn't something to actively think about. I don't think there's any value to the system at the entry level, and I've stopped seeing the value to them at the high level. To me, they're sitting in a state of redundancy, and while I understand their necessity in the games that we already have and don't want them to go anywhere in existing titles, I'd like to see more titles in the future get rid of this feature, in the hopes of getting people closer to the parts of the games that people actually value. 